Let's look at our memory verse this morning for the month of September. They're in your order of worship. If you'd say with me that uh, reference before and after, 2 Timothy 1.12. I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. 2 Timothy 1.12. We also have a call to worship from the 25th Psalm, and we will be singing Love Lifted Me on page number 508. A little typo there in your order of worship is 508. You're close if you go to 505. <laughs> 508. And if you've got that uh, call to worship there... <clears throat> And you found love lifted me on page 508. You can stand with me this morning, <clears throat> if you can, if you're able. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus.
Please be seated. Scripture reading this morning is taken from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 18. Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6 this morning. Just six verses if you'd like to follow along in your Bibles or your pew Bibles there. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I'll give you my message. So I went to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster that I had planned. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Please stand as we sing number 610.
Please be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer before we approach God's word, before the choir comes. Father, again, we thank you this beautiful day, this beautiful place, dear Lord, that we have to come to spend a little time together to get away from this old world, dear Lord, and all of its goings on and the noise and the commotion, dear Lord. And for a little while, perhaps perchance to come before you to calm our hearts, to calm our souls, dear Lord to unite our spirits in celebrating you, dear Lord, and your great grace that we can't even begin to fathom. Thank you, dear Lord, for that. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you, we who are but dust and ashes can come before you, even as you've commanded us to come before you with every worry, every anxiety, every trouble, dear Lord, and give it to you. And Father, we do that this morning as we begin to approach your word. We bring those things to you. A lot of folks, dear Lord, uh, this week, uh, having surgeries and things, we pray for them, dear Lord. Uh, use their physicians, heal them up, restore them to their families and their uh, neighbors, dear Lord, and walking before and worshiping you. Pray for those this morning that are hurting in the hospital. And again, remember those in the nursing homes and those that are shut in at home this morning that just can't get out like they used to. And, uh, and I know that many that would want to be here, but it just, their old bodies just don't work that way anymore. So, Father, we pray for them. We pray again as we are so privileged to gather here this morning, to share these songs with each other, to look into your word this morning. We pray your spirit ministers in their hearts and their bodies as well as while we gather here this morning, dear Lord. Joy, unspeakable and full of glory. They know your presence. They know that you know what it is, dear Father, that they're going through in their life and that they will seek comfort from you by your spirit. And we pray that for them this morning. Thanking you, dear God, again, that we can gather here. Guide us in your word, dear Lord. Show us those things that you would have us to our life and that we might also help in pointing our neighbors to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
give them a head start here this morning. Good to have the choir back. And I'm sure it's not too late if you'd like to come join the choir on Wednesday nights and practice. I'm sure they'd put you to work. Okay, our young people can be dismissed at this time with their teachers and helpers for their lesson this morning. We are in Revelation chapter 18 this morning. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles. It's a lengthy passage. I'm only going to read it once when we get there. And then you'll need to refer to your Bibles as I refer to uh, certain sections of that. As we study it this morning for the sake of time. Now by way of an introduction to try and tie all this together. Back when I began chapter 17 and chapter 18, I quoted from William Barclay. By the way, William Barclay was called the Prince of Expositors by C.H. Spurgeon. And C.H. Spurgeon was a pretty good preacher in his own right. And he referred to him as the Prince of Expositors. But in chapter 17 and 18, they tell us of the fall of Babylon. Chapter 17 is one of the most difficult chapters to interpret in the book of Revelation, he wrote. The best way in which to study them is to read them as a whole, then to make certain general identifications, and so to see the general line of thought in it. And finally, to study it in some detail. This will involve a certain amount of repetition, but in a section like this, repetition is necessary, unquote. And again, that's a good standard for any difficult passage of Scripture. In this final description, uh, or in the final description of the woman we looked at last time, the false religious system, in chapter 17 and verse 18, we read, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth, unquote. The reference to the woman as a city is another link to ancient Babylon, or even further back to ancient Babel and its tower. This time regarded as a religious center of the false religion of that day. This apostate church, represented by the woman, was a combination of religious and political power. And as stated in verse 5, the city and the woman are a mystery. And therefore, they are a symbolic representation. The last verse in chapter 17 introduces us to our chapter this morning, chapter 18, which seems to refer to Babylon more as a literal city of commerce and of government than as a religious institution that we saw last time. So, to try and clarify, two difficult chapters. It seems that chapter 17 emphasizes the religious character of Babylon, like the ancient mystery religions of Babel, while chapter 18 emphasizes the political and economic aspect of this Babylon. In chapter 17, verses 6 and 7, we read, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. The angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Now, the beast and the woman ride together, like we saw last week, but they are not the same. In the end, it appears that once the beast uses the women to gain its power from the people, he turns on her and she is destroyed. In chapter 17, we read in verses 16 and 18, the beast and ten horns that you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin, leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over 
the kings of the earth. Now here in chapter 18, what we have is a lament. A lament is a funeral dirge. It is a mourning uh, song. Uh, it, is, it is written in prose, and some of your Bibles have it written out that way. It shows the poetic formation of the way these verses are. So this is a lament for this Babylon. Now before I re read this lament, let me say this. What if the entire world as you know it, people, things, events, activities of life were suddenly to just collapse? What if your sources of comfort, luxury, money, food, entertainment were lost forever? What about no more gas at the gas stations, let alone rationing? I've been through rationing in the 70s. What about no more little Debbie cakes? No more toilet paper, we've seen that before. No power, no money. Sounds like a bad science fiction movie, doesn't it? A horror movie. Now, those kind of thoughts frighten us. Nobody wants the stock market to crash, the power grid to fail, or their employer to go bankrupt. Much of our lives depend on the world system as we know it, and as we mostly take it for granted that it's just there, it was there when we were born, and it will always be there. And we need to be assured of that. You start not assuring people of that, and look what happens to the stock market. Sadly, that's true in the way of the thinking of many, many Christians. We have become so rooted in this old world and dependent upon it, the way we like it, the way we expect it, the way we want it to be, you know, the good old days. And then there is still all that we take for granted that we think will always be there. One writer wrote, quote, it would take a God-sized rototiller to pull us loose from this old world, unquote. If we're honest with ourselves, we'll probably discover that we are more attached to the things of this world, the normal, the status quo, than we care to think about. It's a sobering realization, though, that when we arrive at Revelation 18, we learn that all those things in the world that receive so much of our time and our attention that we expect and demand and take for granted are marked for burning in the fires of judgment. At the end of Revelation 17, we learn that Babylon is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. It is the end-time capital of a godless worldwide man-made empire under the beast. That future Mecca of me theism, you know, all about man, 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 a religion of man and a kingdom of man, man's way, Babylon, the kingdom of man standing in opposition to the kingdom of God. Now, as I recall, the horror story writer Stephen King in his 1978 post-apocalyptic novel entitled The Stand, it takes place after a worldwide pandemic, by the way. It's picture, he pictured his Babylon as Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> Sin City. I mean, the mother of luxury, entertainment, pleasure, and money. A city built for man and by man. If you were to take all the great cities of the world and merge them into one megapolis, you'd have a Babylon. Remember, the rest of the great cities are dependent upon this beast, and they were all brought down when this city, when this city fell. The world system. You know, we think about, we use terms today like one world bank. World trade. The merchant system. The Fed. The central bank. The G7. Or when Russia's playing nice and likes to play with the other seven people, they make it the G8, but sometimes it's G7, sometimes it's G8, which also includes 23 other countries and the EU that are invited, as well as the uh, International Monetary Fund, a major world banking system that regulates world banking. It all, it all collapses. Now, the, nat the, the, the actual identification of this city this key city and the coming wrath is less important than understanding it will be the center of the beast's final world system which opposes God and opposes his people. Our text is a funeral dirge, like I said, for Babylon. A wailing over 
the fall of this world system. People are going to cry. The good news, however, for some is Babylon will come to an end. And the world system as we know it will end. Let me read our text this morning, if you're following along. In verse 1 of chapter 18, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, and a haunt for every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven. And God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Pour her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torment and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit enthroned as queen. I am not a widow. I will never mourn. Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Now when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her, terrified at her torment. They will stand far off from the city and say, Woe, woe to you, great city, you mighty city of Babylon. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple silk, scarlet cloth, every sort of cotton, wood, and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice and incense, myrrh and frankincense of wine and olive oil of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and human beings sold as slaves." They will say, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your luxury and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will explain, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe to you, great city, where all you had, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, O you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down never to be found again. The music of harpists and musicians and pipers and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No worker of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of the, a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine if in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's important people, but your magic spell on all the nations were led astray, in her was found the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. Four points this morning. The angel's voice, verses 4 through 8, the warning. We're going to look at these three woes briefly and then talk about Babylon's doom. 
First, the revelation of the destruction of Babylon was made by yet another angel, as we've seen angels making announcements throughout the book of Revelation coming down from heaven. This contrasts with one of the seven angels that was mentioned back in chapter 17 in verse 1. One of the seven angels we read there who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come and I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by the many waters. And now we're seeing that punishment. Angels do have great authority as God's messengers, carrying His very words. And they often make terrible pronouncements in not only the book of Revelation, but throughout the Bible. The power and glory of this angel was such that the earth was illuminated by its splendor. In verse 1, the angel's message is summarized very simply, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now the question has been raised is whether or not this is another view of the same destruction we studied in chapter 17 in verses 16 and 17. But the woman in chapter 17 was associated with the political power, which was not the political power. And her destruction apparently brought mourning from, uh, did not bring mourning from the earth when she was destroyed. But by contrast, Babylon here in chapter 18 brings loud weeping from the earth's political and economic powers. So instead of being destroyed and consumed by the ten kings, here the destruction seems to come from an earthquake. And it is probable that this is the, uh, an enlarged explanation of what was described back in chapter 16. We read about that earthquake, 19 and 21. There we read the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. Now that's interesting because this destruction of this city also caused the collapse of a lot of other cities. And of course, those that were politically and economic dependent upon it. God remembered Babylon the Great. He gave her the cup filled with the wine and the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 100 pounds, fell on the people. And they cursed God on account of the plague and of the hail, because the plague was so terrible. So again, maybe this is more detailed as the Bible often does. It lays down a passage and then goes back and delineates it a little, a little further. But what is pictured here is a large, proper, prosperous kind of capital city. A kind of chief city or center of political and ep economic power. The marketplace of the world. Maybe a world bank of some kind. Filled with riches and making many rich. By contrast, the, the judgment of God, uh, he makes it a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit. A haunt for every evil and unclean and detestable animal. Scavengers is probably what it's talking about. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. This world order of which all have partaken. And it describes it as a drug. You know, drugs numb the mind. They drive men to madness. There's a term that's called even some of the oldest of the old movies. Gold fever. Four or five prospectors find a mine, and they just figure, hey, if we kill one of them, we only have to split it two ways. Then they end up killing that, and only have to split it away. It drives people crazy. Money, wealth, and then there's power. There's a line from a movie about the U.S. government and, uh, a uh, secret service agent makes a comment, it's amazing what men will do for an oval office to gain that power and to gain that authority. It's like a drug. Pride and power. So this picture is this once beautiful and opulent mansion full of wealth is turned into a decaying haunted house full of haints. Let's talk about this warning secondly. Then we read, another voice from heaven instructed the people of God to leave the city, get out, so that they would escape the judgment to come. Leave this city. Babylon will receive torture and grief in proportion with her glory and luxury in which she boasted that she was a king. The bigger you are, the harder you fall. Death, mourning, tears, famine, and fire will come on this city in one day. You know, it could take centuries to build an empire like that. It could be brought low in a day. 
the one a day. The city of man, the system of man, brought down in an hour. Now, which begs the question this morning is this. Which kingdom are you living for and serving? The kingdom of man or the kingdom of God? You know, this angel warns, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. There's some interesting plays on words here, and don't have time to get into it with the Septuagint and how you would, what Hebrew word would probably fit here. But this is almost like the same word that was used in Babel of old when they built a tall tower to go to God. Well, they thought they were building a tower to go to God, a man-made system, a man-made kingdom of protection and safety and wealth and religion. But all they were doing was piling up their sins before God. Now God's taking them down. Are you living for the city of man, the Babylon, or for the city of God, the kingdom of the meek, ruled by a prince of peace? Named Jesus. The three woes then follow. When the kings who are involved with this great city see its destruction, they are grieved and they cry, Woe, woe, O great city of Babylon, city of power. Merchants who probably got rich off her bemoan the city's downfall. They'll no longer be able to carry on their commerce and their trade with this city and get rich off of it. The description in verses 12 through 13 indicates the great luxury and wealth of the city. It obviously refers to an economic and a political situation rather than a religious one that we looked at last time in chapter 17. The mourning of the merchants is similar to that of the kings. Woe, 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 O oh great city. The sea captains, sailors, and others in navigational occupations lament in a similar fashion. Woe, woe, O oh great city. Center for worldwide commerce. All three groups, kings, merchants, sailors, speak of her destruction as sudden in one hour. Verse 10, verse 17, verse 19. As the world mourns the destruction of Babylon, the saints are told to rejoice because God has judged her for the way that she treated you. Two responses in this passage. Some weep at her downfall. Others have a praise party. Let's look at Babylon's doom, fourthly. The final and violent destruction of the city is compared to throwing a large millstone in the sea, probably referring to the ripple effect. It affects everybody around it and all those other cities that were connected to it. The lament follows that those who once lived and enjoyed what the city offered them, that lifestyle that it gave them, their health, wealth, and happiness and safety, the harpists, the musicians, the flute players, the trumpeters, the workmen, of any trade will not be seen in the city again. The day the music died. Nor will there be light and the joy of weddings. Light can mean several things. The light of God. The light of God's people having left the city. The light of the Holy Spirit illuminating men's way. But them being plunged into darkness. And no longer light nor the joy of weddings. And that's used throughout Scripture, the joy of weddings. In other words, in good times, in prosperous times, you know what? There's lots of weddings. Lots of singing and rejoicing, and, and that's great times. But when it speaks of no more weddings, it means sadness. There's no more reasons for joy. No more wedding parties. No more weddings. The reason for her judgment is that by her magic spell... All the nations were led astray from her. Interesting thing about that translation's magic spell, that's the word pharmakia. We get our word pharmacy from it. Her magic spell, like a drug, money, power, wealth, success, all those possibilities are like a drug. Make you think dumb. Numbs your brain. Also, she was guilty of murdering the prophets and the saints. Oftentimes, they had the, the uh, job of standing before kings and addressing these very sins to repent or else. And they would shut the prophets up and the 
saints up by just imprisoning them or killing them. And all they tried to do was tell the truth and to prevent the terrible judgment to come. The question remains as to what city is in view here. Common view is you read old commentary, uh, which is mostly what I have or used to have. I've got a lot of the newer stuff now and just catching up. But the uh, older stuff is cheaper when the copyrights run on. So I like guys 100 years ago. Plus, I think that, uh, that uh, the, the scholarship was a lot better back in those days. But anyway, a common view in the old commentary is that this refers to the city of Rome. The reason for that is the prominence of Rome as a seat of the Roman Catholic Church and also the capital of the ancient Roman Empire, that first kind of model of a Roman Empire, Babylon being the one before that. Some find confirmation of this in the fact that the kings and the sea merchants will be able to see the smoke of her burning from out at sea. Other evidence seems to point to the fact that this is Babylon itself located on the Euphrates rivers, which some teach in the end times will be converted into a ship-bearing river. When all the passages are studied, whether literal Babylon, historical Babylon, Rome, or a Roman-like empire, a yet future Babylon, or a spiritual Babylon, Babylon is a metaphor for any leading metropolis of man-made uh, like a uh, 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 city, like, for example, New York. Wall Street, Geneva, Switzerland, Tehran, Iran, Moscow. We could go on and on. The Tokyos, the Dubais, the Hong Kongs, the Beijings, L.A. The only conclusion seems to point to Babylon being a kind of capital city of this world empire that is a leading in economic political power of the end times. The capital of the beast and the woman who rides upon him. However, there are those who hold to a historical view. That is, they see it as already have taken place. They see Babylon as the fall of Rome, which was that mighty city, and when it fell, and when it was burned by Nero, and the Christians got blamed and got killed for it and persecuted for it, it plunged the world into what? The Dark Ages. Dark Ages. However, there, there, so there are good Christian brothers that hold to that historical view. Bible expositors to this very day continue to be divided on this question. Is it historical? Is it yet future? Is it both? Was one just a token in a little way of a fuller uh, future fulfillment? In any case, the destruction of the city of Babylon is the final blow to the times of the Gentiles which probably began when the Babylonian army attacked Jerusalem in 605 B.C. and destroyed that city. And then later, Babylon is now destroyed. In Luke 21, 24, we read also, they will fall by the sword. They will be taken as prisoners to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So Babylon, that once uh, trampled on Jerusalem and destroyed her, will itself, in the end, be destroyed. And there's some plays going on there in the Hebrew language in the book of Genesis. Going back here, in fact, we see Revelation as the completion of a lot of what happened in Genesis. When man sinned and was expelled from the garden, he went east to Shinar, the plain of Shinar, where that's where Babylon is. So Babylon, in the end, you either choose one city or the other. You either obey God's command, His covenant, or you end up serving Babylon. It's one or the other. Jerusalem also was destroyed by Rome, which kind of repeated the same thing as it did in 70 A.D. When Rome destroyed Jerusalem again and wiped it flat. Uh, and uh, again, then shortly, it wasn't long after 70 A.D., two, three hundred years, and then Rome would fall, again plunging the world into the, uh, the dark ages. So, were these just partial fulfillments? Maybe. And there is yet a future greater fulfillment? Another Roman-like or Babylonian-like megalopolis? Could be. So chapter 17 and 18 give us additional insight and information concerning the earth's major religious and political movements during the last hours before the consummation of all things at the end of time. So in chapter 17 and 18, the stage is set for the final climax of the book of the Revelation. 
we come to conclusion this morning. The classic science fiction movie Star Wars ends with the destruction of the Death Star that had terrorized the galaxy, a planet killer. The trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, concludes with the destruction of the Dark Tower of Mordor, the capital of the Dark Lord Saren. In the same way, the annihilation of Babylon represents the destruction of everything evil and demonic in this present world system. And by the way, it's interesting, I wonder where they get their plots, but it was really the Ewoks with Stone Age weapons and bows and arrows that brought down the empire. And do you remember that little party they had when the empire fell? In that last movie? And as I recall, it was two hobbits who brought down Soren. Not necessarily the armors, the armies. And in the Bible, Babylon is brought low by the wrath of a, a lamb and the meek, the hobbits, the Ewoks inherit the earth. But we'll get to that next time in chapter 19. So while the world cries and laments the fall of Babylon, God's people break into a hallelujah chorus. And just to remind you, any who might feel that God's complete destruction on this world system is too extreme or unjust or not fair, the angel reminds us why Babylon had to go and why judgment was needed. Quote, because all the nations were deceived by her sorceries, addicted to her like a narcotic, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been slain upon the earth. Two kingdoms in conflict. It's always been that way. The Cains and the Abels. You either serve the kingdom of God or you serve the kingdom of heaven. Do you remember when we studied 1 John with the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, by the way? Do you remember what he said in his letter in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17? Let me read it to you again in light of what we have just read. Do not love the world. Do you get that now? A little different angle on that? You understand what's going to happen to the world system. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that drug that is so powerful, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Lives forever. A forever generation. Those who do not live for the world, but who live to do the Father's will. Many will lament and cry over the destruction and the collapse of this world system, the kingdom of this world. Others, the saints, will rejoice, will rejoice as they serve in Christ's kingdom. Question for us this morning is, what kingdom, what kingdom do you serve? You know, it's interesting, Jesus told an old Pharisee, probably on the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus, except you be born again, you can't even see the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Are you born again this morning? If not, don't leave this place. You see me, one of the men and women of this church, and we'll sit down and show you from God's Word what your Bible says about your need and how to be, be born again. Let's sing as we uh, close this morning. Please stand and turn to number 437, Send the Light. Yeah. 
standing for the words of the uh, benediction this morning we just studied that when that city was all of God's people were called out of that city there was no more light in it because the light left now is the time for the light to go into the world now is the time for folks for folks to get saved one day that will be there will be no more light when God gathers his, his church out of this old world this morning as you go forth May God be your comfort and your strength. God be your hope and your support. God be your light and your way. And the blessings of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life remain with you now and forever. Amen.